All right, good evening, everybody. Thank you for um, coming out to Rolf Valley tonight. So a big welcome to Rolf Valley Sport and Health. This is um, going to be a two-part uh, subject that I'm going to deal with uh, the first part tonight and the second part in November. But the part we deal with tonight is complete. So don't feel that you know, you're going to end on a cliffhanger and wonder what happens in the next episode. <laughs> but I really want to deal with this subject tonight fairly comprehensively uh, because it's a very important one and one that I've been doing quite a bit of work on and that is why have a heart attack when we can see it coming and I think that's really important and we've all had this experience in in our profession clinically that uh, we don't feel we're doing enough to anticipate these type of problems in the world today and it is important that we do. In fact, the subject even made the cover of Time magazine uh, a short while back. So tonight, what I intend to, to go over with you, and I hope you do find this interesting, <clears throat> we'll look at a few scary statistics, because that always wakes us up and makes it relevant to us, if they are relevant to you as you sit there. I'm going to make the point that more often than not, we are dealing with heart disease when it's too late. And too late can be extremely too late. We need to get rid of some of the old ideas and the old ways of doing things, which unfortunately are still the way that many uh, practitioners practice this area of medicine today. We need to bring in some of the new concepts and the new ideas that we take this into a, a more advanced age. It is your right to be healthy. It is your right to know your state of health. We're going to achieve that by learning how to measure ourselves and how to be measured in terms of heart disease. And very importantly, to bring the concept to you that we have the technology, as they used to say in that old series when I was a child. What was it called? The Six Billion Dollar Man. I used to say, we have the technology. We have the technology now to see the disease. Not just to predict it, but to see it. And we should be using it more often. And then what I will talk about in November is that once we've got a composite knowledge of all this, then we, we really should have the facts to deal with and know what to do about it. And the more modern concepts of dealing with the root causes of heart disease. So, what we're going to learn about tonight is a much more... Uh, modern and a much more accurate way of predicting risk, which includes the new technology of looking at the disease itself and finding out who's got a tipping, ticking time bomb inside their chest. So this is the main problem that worries me a lot, is that more often than not, we deal with heart disease, and what I mean by heart disease, coronary artery disease, people having heart attacks when it's too late. And too late, as I said, can be very too late. It is the number one killer in almost every country in the world. Coronary heart disease is the number one killer. So it's not a small problem. 30 to 40 percent of heart attacks are fatal. And most of those are first time events. So these people don't get up to change their life, to agree with what the doctor's been trying to tell them for the last five years, to agree with their nagging wife who's been trying to hide their cigarettes for the last 25 years. They don't get up to change their lives because their life is over. Men with significant risk factors run the risk of 300% increased risk of having a heart attack. Women, it's six times the risk if they have significant risk factors. And this is something most people aren't aware of. Women are more at risk of heart disease than men. They die twice as often as men, younger, having a heart attack. These are shocking statistics. Women are twice as likely to die within the first year after their first heart attack compared to men. 
A woman is 10 times more likely to die of heart disease than she is to die of breast cancer. And this month, October, is, is pink month, and there's lots of noise about breast cancer, which is very important and a very important health message. But understand its relevance in terms of what kills us. In fact, heart disease kills more women than all cancers combined. So it's a very relevant public and personal health issue. In a recent study that was published studying half a million people, of whom 70% had heart attacks in that population, 75% of those who had heart attacks, their cholesterol was totally normal. So I'm going to say one or two words about cholesterol in this presentation. is isn't going to be about cholesterol. But the message is that cholesterol is VFU which in brief means very useless. So we're talking about coronary artery disease, ladies and gentlemen. We're talking about the disease that causes eventual problems and obstructions in the arteries that supply our heart muscle with blood. And it's a very unique system and a very important system. The coronary arteries, you may or may, know, may, or may not know, exist on the outside of the heart. They're not on the inside of the heart. And what's key about these arteries is the state of the plumbing that allows the blood carrying the oxygen to flow freely through those pipes in order to effectively supply your heart muscle with what it requires to carry on beating along healthily. And the problem that develops in terms of what we call coronary artery disease or coronary heart disease is a pathological process called atherosclerosis, which simply means clogging up of the arteries. Here's a cross-section of an artery and a slide, and you'll see that it's very clogged up in the middle. And that clogging up is called atherosclerosis. And effectively, it starts and accumulates as a buildup of what we call plaque. You've probably heard your dentist talk about plaque on your teeth plaque that builds up in the wall of the arteries and slowly but surely leads to progressive narrowing within the barrel of that pipe. But the problem is not just about narrowing. Atherosclerosis is a very complex disease of arteries and we're only just really getting to understand its complexity and we still don't understand all of it. But the arteries start off when we're younger, very normal, nice clean walls. And then somewhere along the line, we start developing little fatty streaks in them. And then there's an inflammatory reaction that occurs with an invasion of cells. And then we start to see this accumulation of what we call plaque starting to fur up on the arterial wall. Can you see that slide? And then eventually, that plaque starts to, to break and to burst and to rupture and create clots, small ones. But ultimately, it can have a catastrophic rupture causing a catastrophic clot, and that effectively is what happens when one has a heart attack, that this plaque ruptures. It doesn't necessarily have to continue to clog up the arteries until they block completely. And that's a very important concept. As we get into old age, closer to Jeremy than you are to me, then if you have escaped catastrophic rapture up into our older years, absolutely then we might face a situation where the clogging up has almost blocked the pipe completely. But the problem that we are dealing with are the people who are sitting in this zone here, as I'll talk about as we go through. Before we get to the real 90% fearing up of the arteries, and what I'm going to show you tonight is that conventionally with what we've been doing up to this point in time, we only really pick up people in this zone, which is very late into the process of coronary artery disease. But actually, if we modernize our approach, we can pick it up much earlier. We can use much better risk prediction measurements, and I'm going to talk about coronary artery calcium scanning. And these can pick up disease much earlier in the time frame. 
than what we're doing conventionally and currently in risk prediction and in testing. This is a very important slide. This shows the different types of pipe obstructions that we might find in a coronary artery. When we're younger, these blockages might be between 30% and 50%. And as we get older, as I said, that furring may completely, or virtually completely, 90 to 99% obstructions of the coronary arteries. But where is the problem? Why do I say we pick it up too late? And the reason is this. The people who have heart attacks, who drop dead at the ages of 48, 54, are not the people with 99% blockages. They're people with 50% blockages, who up until yesterday were walking around and even running marathons without a problem, until the plaque inside their artery ruptured and a clot formed and they died, or they survived with damage. So the problem is, this is what we are picking up too late. So these individuals will have up to 50% blockage. There will be plenty of blood flow there until such time as the surface of that plaque ruptures, cracks, and the clot forms in there, causing a catastrophic event. So here we have an artery and cross-section, plenty of room, Atheroma, atherosclerosis forming there, less, about 40% left there maybe. And then this part of the plaque here becomes unstable. We call it vulnerable or unstable. And that precipitates a blood clot, and you can now see that that entire pipe is blocked. That is a heart attack evolving. And that will be a catastrophic event for that individual. So can we see better? Can we look into the future better? Can we look at the present better with a greater vision of what's going to happen in the future? Do we have a better way of doing this? Well, in order to answer that, let me tell you what's happening now. This is the current way of doing it. So currently, if you go along to your doctor and they have a chat to you about your risk factors for coronary artery disease, they will come up with the traditional list, which I'm sure you're aware of, smoking, and I'm really going to say very little about smoking, because if you're stupid enough to do that, well, you probably earn your heart attack, so let's exclude those people. But smoking, diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, those are the ones that usually form the, the, the main part of the conversation, and then there may be some mention of that you're getting older, that you're a bit overweight. Uh, if you're lucky, they'll ask you a question about your family history, and there may be some reference to your level of fitness or unfitness. Are you stressed? And then there may be other issues. But generally, the emphasis is on those big four. Would you agree with that? I'm sure you've had that plenty of times. So the first thing I want to say is that the first problem in this is that there's no real ranking in this. and There's no real emphasis on what is the most important where should we be paying attention? It's a list of, list of risk factors. So how does it pertain to you at an individual level? And then the conversation about this, I'm going to talk about a little bit later. Does elevated cholesterol actually have anything to do with heart disease? And the answer is very little. As a simplistic comment as high cholesterol. All right, that might shock some of you, but it has very little to do with your risk. So what your GP is likely to do is they will calculate your heart attack risk as your risk in the next 10 years of having a heart attack, which is fatal or non-fatal, using the conventional risk factors. And there's a, there's a whole formula that's been worked out, and they can put it into their app or into their, into their phone. It'll come up with a risk, a score that will classify you as either low risk, which means you have less than 10% chance in the next 10 years of having a cardiac event, an intermediate or middle risk that says your risk is between 11 and 20%, or that your risk is over 20%, which makes you high risk. And this is the conventional way of doing things. Okay, and it's worked okay, but it's not so okay. So that's the classification you're going to get. What's the problem? The problem is that this 
type of risk scoring is based on population statistics and population data. And its relevance to you as an individual is effectively based on the relevance of you to a population. So in effect, this risk score, which is called the Framingham Risk Score, named after a town in Massachusetts from which a very big heart study was done for many years, it continues today, is nothing more than a statistical guess. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not sure that I want to plan my future on a statistical guess. I'm not so confident about that. And unfortunately, when doctors talk to you, they will give you this information as this is it. This is a precision measurement. It is not. It is a statistical guess. And I'll show you how accurate that statistical guess is a little bit later on. But what's the most important and relevant issue here is that if you are classified as intermediate to high risk, the first thing that most practitioners are going to do is to reach for the prescription pad and write you a prescription, most of the time for statins. All right, people at intermittent and, intermediate and high risk for coronary artery disease are generally going to be put on statin drugs. And that's a whole lecture on its own. So you're going to be committed to Lifelong drugs based on a statistical guess. And the sort of hypothesis behind this is, well, if we treat everyone, we'll save a few. But the question that is relevant is, does everyone need the treatment? And at an individual level, that's a very important question. And then if they think you're a bit higher uh, up this risk scale, they might send you for an ECG, an electrocardiogram, to have a look at your heart. And very often they'll put you on a treadmill and do that with some exercise. So that's called a stress ECG. But the relevance of those tests is that they are only going to pick up the coronary arteries that are blocked at that level. Once again, late and they are not going to pick up these. And where did I say the greatest risk of having a heart attack lies? In the middle risk, in the 50% blockage, this three and four. And these tests do not pick up those individuals. And the, the literature is full of case reports of individuals who went and had their medical investigations. They had their stress ECG on the treadmill and they passed. And the next day they died of a coronary. And everyone went, ugh because their stress ECG was perfectly normal. And it was normal because they had 50% of the pipe still wide open. But the next day, the plaque ruptured for whatever reason. Maybe it was the exercise on the ECG that did it. For some people, that's their first exercise in a decade. So, is the Framingham risk score system, the statistical guess, the best way of doing things? is being classified into those risk groupings relevant to us as individuals. Do we want to base our future on a statistical guess? Well, here's a study that was done in 2008 by the American Heart Association. And just to give you some stats, in this study, 50%, in this study, 50 of the people who had an acute heart attack had totally normal cholesterol. The one I quoted to you at the beginning was a more recent study where 75% had normal cholesterol. So we can pretty much say that between 50 and 75% of people who have a heart attack have perfectly normal cholesterol levels in their blood. The stress test missed most cases of individuals, as I've just told you, who then had sudden cardiac death. So they had normal stress tests, and within a short period of time, they suffered sudden cardiac death. They didn't wake up. Most heart attacks occurred in the middle risk group based on scoring. And 70% of the heart attacks occurred in individuals who had sudden rupture of that soft plaque in that middle group, 50% obstructions. Okay, so we know this is not Austin Jeans' opinion. This is a big published study. So those are the group who had heart attacks, not these guys. These guys, plenty of pipe left there. So is there a better way? Well, there is a better way. And I'm going to show you a better way with what we now know is that we need to measure the, the state of metabolic health, our state of metabolic health, and our lifestyle habits. And as I said, I ain't going to say much about smoking. It's pretty obvious. 
and dangerous lifestyle habit. What is the relative importance of these risk factors? I showed you the traditional risk factors. And I think what's very important, these are the risk factors, the sort of traditional list. And this is what's called in statistics a hazard ratio, which just says well, these are your chances of having an event, a heart attack. Your chances of having a heart attack if you have this risk factor. So the important point is, the only one that's really important in this list is diabetes, because diabetes more than doubles your risk of having a heart attack. Can you see that? The hazard risk ratio is 2.04. That's double. The next most important risk factor is getting older. As we get older, we develop arteriosclerosis in our arteries. So the risk of having heart disease is worse as we get older. Is there much you can do about that one? We wish, but we can't. Smoking is the next one. It increases your risk by about 1.79, nearly 1.8, and then it drops dramatically down with blood pressure at 1.31, and you'll see the total cholesterol is an almost meaningless 1.22. That means the total cholesterol elevated increases your risk by about 20%, which if you know anything about medical statistics is meaningless. It's virtually no risk increase at all. We are only really excited in statistics when we talk about risks when they approach two. So the only one that's relevant on this list. Systolic blood pressure is the higher blood pressure. Yeah. But the key point about the slide is the only one that's relevant is the top one. That's the only one that's relevant. Okay, smoking is important, and age we can do absolutely diddly squat about. So the, the Framingham risk score, the traditional risk scores I showed, you didn't really have an appreciative scale attached to them. You just had a list. What was important, not really sure. Now I've shown you there's importance, but it pretty much hinges on the top uh, uh, condition called diabetes. So if we look at modern risk factors that are focusing on metabolic health and lifestyle factors, we can start putting them into a sort of scale. And on the slide, the scale is represented by the boldness and the size of what I'm putting up there. Diabetes is head and shoulders above everything else. Then we can put smoking. Then we can put pre-diabetes, because pre-diabetes is very important. Pre-diabetes is where you're not normal, but you're not diabetic, but you're on your way to being diabetic. And it also dramatically increases our risk of heart disease. It's also called metabolic syndrome. Age, we know that's very important. That's a, a reasonable risk factor. Then we drop down to blood pressure. And then we drop down not to high cholesterol, but what we call atherogenic lipid profiles, which I'm going to talk about, but predominantly a low HDL cholesterol and a high triglyceride count in the blood are risk factors for heart disease. Are they the cause of heart disease? Most likely not. And we will, in November, talk about the difference between risk factors and root causes. We can be more specific about just talking about being overweight to obese, where the location of the weight gain is in the belly. Belly fat predicts heart disease, not just being overweight, specifically belly fat. Family history, very important. I'll talk to you about being unfit, lack of exercise. And then things like stress and others. And there's some others now that we can specifically add to this with what we know. The one is a high omega-6 to omega-3 ratio in the body. And the way we achieve that, which we don't want to achieve, is eating too many vegetable oils and frying our food in vegetable oils. That's how we get an imbalance in our omega-6 to 3 ratio, but that's a talk for November. And trans fats, which are nasty fats made by industry and put in our foods that are very bad for our arteries. So there are some other factors we can put in there. Now what's really important, if we rearrange this slide a little bit more on the basis of color, is we can look at this from the perspective of metabolic health and how does that influence heart disease. So if we look at it like this, we've just put smoking down the bottom there. We know that's important, but we're getting it out the way. Diabetes and pre-diabetes, high blood pressure, atherogenic lipid profiles, belly fat obesity, and family history are all conditions that we know are associated and caused by the metabolic problem of insulin resistance, which I'll say something about just now. And insulin resistance is a dietary-induced metabolic disorder in the human body. So all of these heart disease risk factors come down to one big problem. 
metabolic insulin resistance, a dietary-induced abnormality in the human body. And interestingly enough, as I mentioned, omega-6-3 ratios and trans fats are also nutritional issues. So we're starting to see a pattern here about where the impact of lifestyle is likely to have the biggest impact on heart disease. So we know that insulin resistance is a disorder of metabolic health. It's related to sugar, insulin, and fat storage. And to give you a slightly more complicated diagram, not to spend too long on it, those who've come to my diabetes talk will have seen this before. We all have a certain amount of carbohydrate and sugar that our body is prepared to tolerate, and it's very individually variant. And once we exceed our level of carbohydrate tolerance, we develop increasing insulin resistance because high sugar promotes high levels of insulin. High levels of insulin promote insulin resistance. Insulin resistance promotes storage of fat, and that storage of fat will be in the liver and then in the body, specifically and mostly in the belly. And once we have that, we have disease. And those diseases will be obesity, diabetes, heart disease we're talking about tonight, and even cancer. So the primary metabolic disorder behind all of this is insulin resistance. And insulin resistance is predominantly responsible for most of the risk factors for coronary artery disease. So that's a different way of looking at things. It's not about cholesterol. And actually, this whole concept of cholesterol and good cholesterol and bad cholesterol really is just fairy stories. Okay? We never really worry about cholesterol because it's never had anything to do with dietary cholesterol. Dietary cholesterol has no impact on blood cholesterol. Did you know that? Okay, so there's no relationship between what you eat and what happens in your blood. What happens in your blood is related to what your liver is manufacturing. Okay, so high cholesterol in the blood is because we make too much of it, not because we eat too much of it. And cholesterol is carried in little submarines of different sizes. Uh, and this HDL submarine is what has been colloquially referred to as good cholesterol. And the LDL submarine or lipoprotein is what has been colloquially called, to, uh, called the bad cholesterol. So it's not about cholesterol. It's most certainly about two dimensions of lipids. When your doctor orders your blood test for cholesterol, he gets a lipid profile telling him or her what your total cholesterol is like, or the level of it, what your HDL cholesterol is, what your LDL cholesterol is, and what your triglycerides are. It gives all that information. So are we interested in the lipid profile? Yes, we are. Are we excited about the total cholesterol? No, we are not. We want to know what your HDL is and what your triglycerides are. If your HDL is low and your triglycerides floating around your blood are high, those are markers of insulin resistance. So those abnormal lipid profiles signify that you have insulin resistance. And the metabolic pathways of that I'm not going to go into, but triglycerides in the blood definitely increase your risk of heart disease. The yellow one here is for women, so triglycerides in the blood predict a higher risk of heart disease for women than they do in men. And this little chart simply says this. If you increase bad cholesterol, but your HDL remains very high, your risk of heart disease stays in the green zone. Does that make sense to you? And if you increase total cholesterol or LDL cholesterol, but your HDL is very low, your risk of heart disease goes up dramatically. So the risk of heart disease is not about your bad cholesterol, it's about how low your good cholesterol is, not how high your bad cholesterol is. The key factor is HDL. And what causes low HDL is insulin resistance. And what, ladies and gentlemen, causes insulin resistance? Eating too much sugar and refined carbohydrates. Do you see where this conversation is going? Okay, so that's very important. It's not about cholesterol. And this is just one I chucked in because it really uh, highlights the issue with cholesterol and its imbalance against other risk factors when you talk about heart disease. So this is blood cholesterol on, on, on this part of the graph. And here is the age-adjusted coronary heart disease death rate. So your, your number of deaths occurring related to cholesterol level. Now, the little dotted blocks are men without diabetes. So pe people without diabetes... And as their cholesterol goes up, there is some elevation in, in, 
in the number of heart attacks, but it's not a significant increase in risk. But now look what happens when you look at people with diabetes, which are the striped bars. So the person with a very low cholesterol with diabetes has a dramatic risk of heart disease. The person with an elevated total cholesterol and diabetes has got a staggering risk of heart disease. So is cholesterol the issue or is diabetes the issue? This graph tells you very clearly the risk factor. Okay? It's not about cholesterol, it's about diabetes. And diabetes is a disease of insulin resistance. And insulin resistance is caused by sugar and refined carbohydrates. So actually, if you look at this graph, which I stole from Tim Noakes, this is the risk of having a heart attack related to your total cholesterol level. That's used as a baseline. If you measure average blood sugar over 90 days, this is the risk of heart disease against blood sugar compared to the risk related to cholesterol. Do you see how predictive blood sugar is of heart disease risk as opposed to cholesterol? It's a dramatically and much more precise indicator of risk. So blood sugar, if you just measure average blood sugars over 90 days, you see risk. Right, so back to the cornerstone of what I want to tell you. We need to be looking at this group of coronary arteries rather than waiting for those to show us that they have a problem. Too late, she cried. So we need better risk prediction and we need to do things better than we have been doing. So how do we do better risk prediction? Well, better risk prediction is simply based on looking at family history, looking at measures of your insulin resistance, and seeing the disease. Right, family history. What's important in family history? Is there a history of premature heart disease under the age of 55 in, a, in your father, or under 65 in your mother or any other first-degree relatives. Early onset heart disease, coronary heart disease in your first-degree relatives predicts that you have genetic factors which significantly increase your risk of also having early heart disease. So it's not a factor to ignore. It's neither something that you can change, but it's something that you shouldn't ignore. And although there's a lot of research into what are these genetic factors, one of the key genetic factors is that our genetics predict our carbohydrate intolerance. They predict our carbohydrate intolerance. They predict that at some point in time in life, we will reach a limit of how much carbohydrate we can take in, and over that limit, we'll become insulin resistant. And for some people, they've got a very high carbohydrate tolerance, and for some people, they have a low. And those with the lowest carbohydrate intolerance are going to be the ones who are going to become insulin resistant, who become pre-diabetic, or diabetic, and are the ones who are going to get heart disease. That's the point. So family history, in part, predicts our susceptibility to insulin resistance. And is that important? It's hell of important because diabetes is a worldwide epidemic. If you know anything about diabetes, it's increased from 100 million in 1980 to over 400 million in 2014 worldwide. Projected to go over 600 million by 2035. So it's a massive epidemic. And this is just a slide I pulled off the UK but diabetes prevalence in the UK is massive. One in 11 English people have diabetes. But what's more important is that one in three adults in the UK have prediabetes. So for every diabetic, there are at least two to three more prediabetics. Half of all diabetics do not know they have the disease, and nine in 10 prediabetics do not know they have the disease because no one's tested them for insulin resistance. They're walking around with a time bomb in their chest. So what measurements can we do? Well, we can do some measurements on ourselves. You can do these yourselves. You can simply do your waist measurement because belly fat predicts insulin resistance. And in turn, belly fat predicts a significant increase in the risk of having a heart attack. It more than doubles your risk. So if you're a man, you shouldn't have a waist measurement that exceeds 102 centimeters and you shouldn't have a waist that exceeds 88 in a woman. I'm going to send you this on email, so don't panic about writing too much. I've got a nice list for you. You can actually do a ratio of your waist measurement to your height, and if that exceeds 0.5, in other words, if your waist exceeds half of your height, you have a significant belly fat in place, and you have a significant risk of insulin resistance and heart disease. Your blood pressure. Blood pressure is predominantly a disease of insulin resistance, not salt. Insulin resistance. 
And if it exceeds 120 over 80, you increasingly have a risk of having a heart attack. And one that's not necessarily insulin resistant related, but another test you can do is to do your resting pulse rate, your resting heart rate in the mornings, and get an idea of what that is. And if it's more than 70, that dramatically increases your risk of having a heart attack. So if your resting heart rate exceeds 70, it's a marker of a very unfit, unhealthy cardiovascular system. Simple tests. And then the test that we should be doing, all right, and you should be asking us to do, cholesterol, no. We want to know about insulin resistance. So if we want to know about insulin resistance, we want to know what your fasting insulin is like. So this is your insulin when you have breakfast, lunch, and supper. It spikes up depending on how much carb you're eating. And overnight, you'll hit a, a fasting insulin state, which we can test in the morning. So we want to know what your fasting serum insulin is like. And those levels are very important. If they're low, it's good, and if they're high, it's bad. It says you've got insulin resistance. Yes, we will ask for a cholesterol profile, but what are the things we're interested in is not the total cholesterol. We want to know about your triglycerides and your HDL. We want to know if your triglycerides are high and your HDL is low because that predicts insulin resistance. That increases your risk of heart disease. And th these are the kind of levels, and I'm going to send these out to you, that we would say are optimal. We have an optimal level of your insulin, optimal level of your sugar, and your HDL and your triglycerides. We have levels that will say those are good. We'll say those are not good. And if they're not good, we have to pay attention. And we might be feeling in perfect, wonderful health when we get those results. And then the next and probably most important and crux of what I came to tell you tonight is that we have the technology to see the disease before it strikes you down. And we're not using it enough. And, you know, we do it in other conditions. We do scans on the breast called mammograms to look for breast cancer. We do prostate scans to look for prostate cancer. And we do colonoscopies in the colon to look for colon cancer. So why on earth aren't we looking at the heart? Because we can. And the technology we have to do that is looking for calcium in the coronary arteries. We can look and see calcium in the coronary arteries. And why is that relevant? And we can score it. The computer will give us a coronary artery calcium score called CAC scoring. And it's a 60-second CAT scan. 60 seconds. It has no more radiation than a mammogram. No needles, no sticking dye into your bloodstream. No contrast, just go in, one minute, come out. And get some pictures. Now, what do these pictures actually show us? Well, when we look at that plaque in a coronary artery, it's quite similar to an iceberg. Most of the plaque is below the water, but the top of the plaque, which is on top there, is in most cases got calcium in it. And the CAT scan can pick up the calcium at the top of the plaque. And the volume of calcium is directly proportional to the volume of softer plaque that's underneath. Does that make sense? So we're not seeing all of that on the CT scanner. We're seeing this. But we know that if we see this, this is underneath. That's the principle of coronary artery calcium scoring. Can't see this. We can see this. But we know that this occupies about 20% of plaque. And the other 80% we can't see. But if we can measure the 20%, we can interpret the 80%. Does that make sense? So effectively, we can prove that there's calcified plaque there, which then gives us confirmation of the unproven uh, soft plaque that lies underneath, which is dangerous because that's the stuff that ruptures. That's the stuff that causes heart attacks. The reason we have calcium in the plaque is, in fact, that by putting calcium in there, we think that's one of the ways that the body's trying to reinforce the plaque and keep it stable. So over time, we will calcify that plaque more and more to try and stabilize it. So if we look inside a coronary artery, we know that it's starting to fur up with plaque, some of which is calcified, about 20%. When we come out of the CAT scanner, that white streak there is calcium in a coronary artery. And the computer will measure its volume and its density and give us a score. 
and its distribution. And it, it's scored on a linear scale. You get different, um, different uh, subsets of this, but essentially most coronary artery scoring has got four categories. And that is you have zero calcium. That's very good. You've got no calcium. Your calcium score is 1 to 99. That means you've got mild calcium. You've got mild evidence of atherosclerosis in the arteries. A score between 100 and 400, that's moderate calcification. There's moderate atherosclerosis. And then any score over 400 and even over 1,000, that's severe and extensive coronary artery disease visually being identified, being seen. It's not a guess anymore. It's not a statistical guess. You can see it. And in scoring it, you can decide how much there is and how bad that's going to be. And there are direct predictions based on your coronary artery calcium score and what's going to happen to you in the next 2 to 10 years. If you have a zero score, you have virtually no chance of having a cardiac event in the next 10 to 15 years. None. If you have a score over 400, you have a 7 to 8 times chance that you're going to have a coronary event in the next 2 to 5 years. And if it's over 1,000, the fuse is lit. So the calcium score correlates directly with the risk of events and the likelihood of the coronary arteries becoming obstructed. And this is the um, CT scan of a, a friend of mine who's a doctor in the States, uh, who's a big uh, physician like me in the area of, of nutrition and health. And this is his. So this is his uh, CAC score, and there is no calcium. And he's actually only a little bit younger than me. He's got no calcium in his coronary arteries. So he's got a warranty on his coronary arteries for the next decade. That's good news. And there is a contrasting CT scan, and there's a lot of calcium in that left anterior descending coronary artery. So those are two very different scans, which predict two very different futures for those two individuals with respect to their heart. Okay. Essentially what the coronary calcium score shows is how far above your age normal calcium score are you? Everyone's calcium score is going to go up as we get older. That's natural. Okay? So if you've got a score that's above your age norm, this is the 25% of your age group, this is where their coronary artery calcium is, this is the 50% of your age group, and this is the 90% centile. So if you're above this line, you're way above what's normal for your age group. And that is abnormal. So you can see whether you're abnormal for your age, and you can look at the absolute score to quantify your risk going forward. This just shows you the, the risk of having a heart event between 0 and 100. That's a sort of one average risk. Then once it goes up to 500, the risk more than doubles. And when you've got a score over 500, the risk more than triples of having an acute heart event. In fact, that was risk of dying. Risk of dying from a cardiac event. And this is also just a table to show you. There's the calcium scores in the four grades, naught up to 100, 200 and 399, over 400. And these are the relative risk ratios. This is another statistical measure of your relative risk of having a cardiac event. So at naught, which is the reference, that's the average uh, but your cardiac event risk is virtually zero. In this category, it doubles. In this category, it goes up by 10 times. And over 400, it's more than 26 times the relative risk of having a cardiac event. That's quite significant. And the absolute risk is six times more uh, if you've got a coronary score of over 400. And I'm sorry this is a little bit of out of focus, but this is just to show the contextual comparison of using traditional individual risk factors to predict risk. So this is being female, this is high cholesterol, this is high blood pressure, this is diabetes, this is smoking, and this is a family history, and this is the relative risk of having a heart event. Can you see that? And now this is coronary artery calcium scoring. Here's the score up to 100, up to 400, up to 1,000 and over 1,000. Do you see how much more predictive that score is? That predicts your risk significantly. These are vague. So this tells you as an individual what your risk is because it's your calcium in your coronary arteries. 
These compare you to populations and don't tell you what your absolute risk is likely to be. Another way of looking at it is that you can say that if you have a coronary artery calcium score of 23 at the age of 44, and there are apps that do this for you, your arterial age is closer to 62. Does that make sense? So if I've got a coronary artery calcium score and I'm only 44, and my score is 23, effectively my coronary artery is at the age of 62. They are way ahead of me in age. Okay, they have got significant um, coronary artery disease, significant atherosclerosis, which would not be surprising if I was 62, but is very abnormal at, at 44, and that means that somewhere between 44 and 62, something's very likely to happen. This is a 10-year coronary event rate against calcium scoring, so again, just makes the point from zero to 99 to 100 to 400, you have a dramatic increase in 10-year coronary event rates directly related to the amount of calcium in the coronary arteries. It predicts the event. Even more importantly, if we look at people with metabolic syndrome, prediabetes and diabetes, when you look at their coronary arteries and look at the calcium in there, look at their risk. So here's a, no, no diabetes, no prediabetes with a zero score. But look, these are diabetics and prediabetics with a zero score. They have a they have a risk. These people, up to 99, up to 400, and over 400, you can see that in all these cases, the presence of metabolic disease dramatically increases risk. So what is your state of metabolic health? So, are we happy with statistical guessing? We shouldn't be. We have much better ways of doing it. And I'll show you why that's important. These are the coronary artery scans from three individuals who were classified according to their older system, the, the, the risk scoring system, as having the same risk. This person has no calcium. This person's got a little bit of calcium. Their risk score probably up to 100. And this person has extensive calcification. The risk is way over 400. Yet on the statistical guess they were told they had the same risk. You see the weakness in the traditional system. Do a scan on the arteries. Sorry, you've got very different risks. Important to plan your own individual action plan. These are the five-year death rates, uh, again, using the Framingham risk score um, against coronary uh, calcium. So this is the, how many heart attacks were taking place. So these people were all placed in low risk by the traditional risk scoring, but then the coronary artery calcium scoring placed them into many different categories. See that? Okay. So some of them were significant risk, almost as much risk as these people into intermediate. So the bottom line is being classified as low, intermediate, or high according to traditional scoring does not give everyone the same risk. It's not. It's a statistical guess. When you do the coronary artery calcium scoring, the risk is dramatically different. Okay, so these are different subsets of people who are classified in those very simple statistical categories according to risk scoring. So the coronary artery calcium scores there, less than 10 up to 100, place them in very different risk categories. This is the number of individuals who were reclassified using coronary artery calcium scoring when they were put into a risk scoring of 10, low, intermediate, 10 to 20, and high, more than 20. 12 to 15% of people were reclassified who were originally classified as low. 52 to 66% of individuals were reclassified from intermediate to either low or high. And 34 to 36% of individuals, when they had their coronary arteries scanned, were reclassified into low or intermediate when they were originally classified as high. Again, just to make the point, statistical guessing is guessing. Coronary artery calcium scoring says this is where you are. And a total of 19 to 25% were reclassified. So what's the issue here? I told you that if you have an, a traditional risk scoring and you end up in intermediate to high risk, you are likely, depending on what your doctor feels, to be committed to drugs and usually statins. So I use the word condemned to statins. In a 2013 study on cardiovascular disease risk, a total of 2,000 
odd patients, which were 49% of the patients who were at moderate to high risk, according to risk scoring, were put on statins, according to conventional screening and conventional guidelines. However, when they had their coronary artery calcium done, 41% had a zero score. 21% had a mild score. Okay? Or mild going to moderate, mild to moderate score, over 100. So the bottom line is, all these people did not need to be on statins. Actually, nearly half of them did not need to be on statins. But without this knowledge, they were going to carry on taking statins for the rest of their life. Based on conventional risk scoring, which hinges a large, large, to a large extent on what your cholesterol level is. In the same study, 610 patients who were classified at moderate risk, who were also put on statins, more than half of them when they went for coronary artery calcium scoring had a zero score. More than half of those patients did not need to be on statins because they had zero chance of a coronary event in the next 10 to 15 years. And I don't know about you, I don't want to take lifelong drugs if I don't need them. Because they have side effects, and that's an issue. So who should have coronary artery calcium scoring? Important question. It can be done here in Zimbabwe. It's available at Diagnostic Imaging. We've had it for a year. If you are a youngish man or a youngish lady, 40 to 50 years a man, 50 to 60 years a lady, and you have a family history of early heart disease which predicts insulin resistance and predicts that you're also going to have insulin resistance and that you have a higher risk of heart disease, and your insulin resistant markers, whether they're belly fat or the blood tests that we do on you, show that you have insulin resistance, you should go for a scan. Because you would like to know at 45 that you have the arteries of a 62-year-old and you may well be heading for a disaster. And I had a 45-year-old man who had a heart attack recently who was a fit, skinny runner like me who was not able to get from his doctors or his cardiologists in South Africa why he had a heart attack at 45 when he ran marathons and he was a skinny bugger. So we did... One test on him. Do you know what it was? We didn't do that because he'd already been down south and had an angiogram and had a stent put in. So it's pointless doing that because we knew that he had blocked up arteries. We did a fasting serum insulin on him and it was off the chart. He has severe insulin resistance. No, he's alive. He survived this heart attack. He came to ask me the question as to why did I have a heart attack? And when can I go back to running? So the reason he had a heart attack was two things, actually, because I asked him a question. Did anyone in your family have a heart attack at a young age? Yes, my father had his first heart attack at the age of 48. Wasn't that really interesting? So here's a man who should, at 40 years old, with that family history, have had insulin-resistant markers, had a coronary artery calcium score, almost definitely would have had a score of 600 and, and above, and then should have gone for preemptive. In, uh, intervention. Instead, he had a heart attack, and he lucky he survived. He was in the 50% that survived. If you've had a traditional heart risk score like the Framingham done, and you've been placed in intermediate to high risk, and or have been put on statin drugs, you should go and have a coronary artery calcium score to figure out whether you should be on these drugs. I showed you in that study published, almost half of the patients were reclassified because they had a zero score. They don't need drugs. And if you are getting older in the normal sense of events and you don't have a family history of early disease and you haven't got significant insulin resistance markers that you know about, then I suggest that you have your insulin resistance markers measured and if there are any other significant risk factors like you have smoked for 20 years, then I think that you should go and have a coronary artery calcium score so you know what your risk is. Why have the heart attack at 60 if you can see it coming? That's the message. So, I hope I've been able to show you that the risk for coronary artery disease is here. Yes, it's there, but the biggest risk is here. This is where most heart attacks occur and this is where most people die. And we can see it coming. And if we can see it coming, we can do something about it, which will be the topic of my next talk. So we can detect early with good risk predictors, look for, for insulin resistance. We can do coronary artery calcium 
uh, scans and look and see the disease and get a score and see what our absolute risk is going to be. And if need be, we can do this later on as part of that process, but this is what we're only doing at the moment, and it's too late. And if we do it early, we're going to miss this because most of these pass their stress tests. So it's not telling us anything. So I'm going to send this out to you. This is the sort of measurement thing that we would carry out in our practice now. These are the measurements for insulin resistance, body measurements, blood measurements, and if need be, we can send people for a CT coronary artery calcium score, and obviously we want to see that you have that less than 100, then everyone's happy. Zero, you've got warranty. Less than 100, you've got a good warranty. Thank you very much. So, for those of you who know that I wrote a book, there's lots of the stuff in the book and lots of information about what to do in the book based on nutrition and metabolic mayhem and insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome. But I am going to further this talk in November and talk about what we need to do if we know we have heart disease. What we need to know if we've got high levels of insulin resistance. What are we going to do? What actions are we going to take? And also there's a lot of new research into the treatment of heart disease and the things we can take and the things we can eat and the supplements we should be having. And I'm going to deal with that at the end of November. We'll let you know by email when that's going to be. It'll be in the last week of November. But I'm very happy to take any questions. I hope that was interesting. And for some of you, it may make a difference in how you live the rest of your lives. <laughs>